Hello, folks who have joined us. We're getting ready to start. We'll give it a couple more seconds for any latecomers. All right, let's get underway. Um, welcome everybody to webinar number three in our DC history series of Washington Walks webinar Wednesdays. I'm Carolyn Crouch and I'm the founder of Washington Walks really happy how these webinars are going so far. I am learning a lot. I expect you all who are participating are learning a lot too. That is definitely gonna be the case today when we talk about uh, the dangers diplomats face and how they are kept safe by our US State Department. And we're going to do that with my brand new Washington Walks colleague, Mark Bellamy. Those of you who are Washington Walks fans and have been on a lot of our walks, you've not had a chance to go on a walk with Mark yet because he's brand new this year. And uh, I can tell you, because I was there for his audition, every Washington Walks guide, perspective guide, has to not only do an interview with us, but they have to give us a walking tour. And the walking tour that Mark gave us, those of us who were there of Lafayette Park was first rate. Could not wait for him to do Embassy Row. That was gonna be in his brief for Washington Walks. He hasn't gotten to do it yet because of COVID, but I'm very pleased he is able to tap into his experience as a former ambassador to talk with us about this topic today. And the image that you all are seeing on your screen, it's a memorial to Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Moffitt. And it's a site that we talk about on the Embassy Row Walk, have done since we gave that walking tour. It's one of our original tours from two decades ago. Mark, um, how did you become a diplomat? Ah. Well, uh, it was almost by accident. Uh, I was uh, sleeping on the floor of my sister's apartment in Berkeley, California, after graduate school, when somebody suggested, let's go downtown to uh, downtown San Francisco and take the foreign service exam. Actually, I had to register <laughs> for it a few, few weeks in advance. And so I did. I took the Wait, exam. You took it cold? Yeah. What? Yeah. Uh, well, you didn't know that people no, no real way to prepare for it, except, you know, um, you know, uh, maybe you could prepare for it by, you know, reading a couple of um, months of back issues of, of The Economist magazine, but there was no real preparation for it. Wow. So uh, I, I took the exam, I passed it, uh, and uh, I had to go through some other exams as well, and I, I didn't know whether I was actually going to, to do anything with it, but I, I eventually decided uh, to uh, leave my job uh, at a bank in Los Angeles against the uh, advice of all my friends and come to uh, Washington. And uh, I arrived here in the uh, waning days of the long forgotten presidency of Gerald Ford, uh, 1977, January 1977. So that's and a year after this incident. Now this was just, 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 just three or four months. After yeah. the um, where, where did you, how long were you um, with the Foreign Service and where did you end up serving? Uh, I was with the Foreign Service for 30 years and um, uh, almost all of that time I served overseas. Uh, I served uh, initially, I'll talk a little bit about it, in um, Naples, Italy, uh, I did two tours in Paris, France, uh, in the embassy there. Uh, I served uh, in our embassy in Canberra, Australia. But I ended up spending, it, 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 towards the end of my career, I ended up spending most of my time in Africa. It was an area that had come to interest me a great deal. And my final assignment overseas was as U.S. ambassador uh, to Kenya. To Kenya, wow. Wow. Well, let's, we're going to do a little technical do -si do right now, folks participating. I'm going to stop sharing my computer screen with you all and Mark is going to share 
his screen, and that is where his presentation lives that he's going to share with us. Hopefully. Okay. Yeah. We rehearsed. We did rehearse. Here's share screen. And let's see. That work? Can you? I'm not seeing it. Oh wait, no, I'm not seeing it yet. Let's see. Here it comes. Here it there is. We there we go. Have we got it? Yep. And we can do. Yep. How about that? Mm, better people, start with. I would go back and do um, click on slideshow, okay. which is in the orange um, space. Yep. There you go. People who are participating are probably going, go from play from start. There you go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, Bravo. You know, I've been impressed. I've spent a lot of time on Zoom with different kinds of presentations and videos and Google Classrooms. Um, and I've been impressed by the collective patience of folks because for many of us, this is a learning curve. But we're gonna end COVID with a whole new skill set. I guess I'll be grateful for that. <laughs> but anyway, this is shared in circle. Mark, where were you September 1976? Boy, I'm trying to remember where I was. Um... I'm pretty sure that I was in, um, I think I was in Los Angeles uh, at, that, at that time. I had completed my graduate studies. I'd come back from uh, Europe. Uh, I was working in Los Angeles trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And I think I was probably someplace in Los Angeles when this, the news of this shocking assassination uh, came out. And you were, so you were aware of it? You remember hearing about it? Very much, very much so. Very much so. I mean, uh, it was uh, it was a it was a shocking event, and as I was going to mention, it's it was um, it was um, this this remains to this day the only um, proven act of state sponsored terrorism uh, in in the United States. Emphasis uh, on proven, I guess. Well, there may there may be some other incidents, but this this is this is the only known incident, I should say. Of state sponsored terrorism uh, on US soil. Although uh, folks are probably now immediately thinking, wait, what about September 11? Yeah. Those yeah, actors. Well, those were not, those were non state actors. Ah. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. okay. The non state actors are the problem, not the state actors. So, uh, and, 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 and also remember too that the, that the coup in Chile uh, in 1973 had been enormously controversial. Uh, and was still very much a live, a live political issue uh, in the United States and, and internationally. Um, and um, uh, and so and so the bombing of uh, of Orlando Letelier, the killing of Orlando Letelier, was you know was a headline event. I mean, September twenty second, six six uh, six column banner headline uh, in the Washington Post, front page news uh, all over the world. Tremendous outcry from Congress, from 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 the Senate. Um, <laughs> even the Chilean embassy issued an indignant statement talking about this outrageous act. Although, as it turns out, uh, the act itself was uh, the Chilean embassy doing very well. Uh, that this, right. this <laughs> they weren't as indignant as they wanted us to think they were. And it's this very peaceful setting. This is a time capsule of late 19th, early 20th century Washington mm -hmm. on Embassy Row. Mm -hmm. And this is where a car explodes. Yep, there, there he is. And the car exploded right there on Embassy Row. I'm sorry, on Sheridan Circle. This was the, uh, the angle. Uh, it's right next to the, uh, I think it's the Romanian Embassy. The Greek Embassy is across the street. The Turkish Ambassador's residence is just to the left. And who was in the car? In the car with, uh, well, uh, the driving the automobile was Orlando Letelier, and I'll, I can talk a little bit about him. I think I should talk a little bit about his background. Seated next to him uh, was a young American woman, Ronnie Moffat, who was a colleague at the Institute for Policy Studies in DuPont Circle, and in the rear seat was her husband. So there were the three of them. They were commuting from 
uh, Latelier's home uh, in, uh, in Bethesda, en route to Bu DuPont Circle. They entered here at about 9.40 in the morning and the bomb detonated uh, underneath, um, underneath Latelier's seat. And uh, he was... Um, and I think you have an image of that, don't you? Well, I do have an image of the uh, actual... This is, this is, this is Latelier. These are stock pictures of Latelier. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about him. Uh, there's, these, are the, these are the pictures of the, of the vehicle after the bombing. Uh, you can see here, uh, police have gathered. This is in front of the Turkish uh, ambassador's residence. Um, that looks like you don't survive that if you're no, in the seat. Um, Latelier was cut in half by the, by the blast. He was killed instantly. Uh, Ronnie Moffat in the seat next to him died of her wounds shortly thereafter. Her husband in the back seat somehow survived. Uh, car parts were thrown onto the roofs of uh, nearby buildings here, on the roofs of nearby embassies. Windows were shattered up and down Embassy Row. People poured into the streets from the embassy. Uh, and the police were on the scene very, very quickly. Um, but, um, yeah, there was, uh, there was, there was tremendous sense of shock after this. Who wanted, why did, why did someone wanted Orlando Latelier out of the way? This guy, here he is. Uh, this is Augusto Pinochet, who is the, let me back up. Um, General Pinochet overthrew President Salvador Allende in a coup in 1973, killing Allende in the process. Um, and Orlando Letelier, standing here next to Allende, was the first official rounded up, of hundreds rounded up, and of thousands of supporters rounded up. Uh, he was uh, moved from detention camp to detention camp. Uh, he ended up on a small island off the coast of Antarctica. He was beaten, he was tortured. Uh, he was eventually released uh, under international pressure, but stripped of his citizenship and exiled, expelled from Chile, and ended up in Washington. Why did he come to Washington? Came to Washington. Uh, he uh, was a professor at AU. He was with the Institute for Policy Studies. He was a very powerful and effective voice um, denouncing the Chilean junta and rallying international opposition to the uh, junta. And, and, was, he, and he was being effective. He, he was, was being effective. He was effective and, and he knew that his life was in danger. Uh, and, and he knew that his life, life was in danger because the Chilean government at that time was um, conducting a, a campaign to uh, hunt down and assassinate uh, Chileans in exile, opposite opponents of the regime. This is a car bombing in Buenos Aires in 1974, which killed the former Chilean head of the armed forces and his wife, who had opposed the coup. Uh, so Letelier knew that he was in danger, but he told his colleagues that uh, he didn't feel endangered in the United States, endangered mm -hmm. in the United States. He, th he thought, they'll never try anything in the United they States. Dare, they won't dare kill me here. Mm -hmm. They won't dare kill me here. Now, he, he probably would not have been so sure had he known that um, just, actually, just six days before the assassination, Secretary of State Kissinger, shown here meeting Latelier in June of 76. Or Pinochet, had, right? Yeah had rescinded instructions to U.S. ambassadors in South America and Latin America to go in and warn governments against Operation Condor. Operation Condor was the code name for this campaign of assassinations being carried out by Chile, by Argentina, and a number of other countries. So say that again. Okay, let me say that the again. The Ministry of State Kissinger gave an instruction don't deliver that message. Don't deliver that message. Don't deliver those instructions. And so those instructions, and, and so, so the warnings that were to be delivered were not delivered, as it turns out. And um, now that doesn't mean that it would necessarily prevent the assassination. But six days later, Latelier becomes the latest victim and the most spectacular victim of uh, Operation Condor. So um, I'm going to go back here. Uh, as I said, this is this is to this day I think the only you know the only proven act of state-sponsored terror uh, in uh, in U.S. history. And I'll uh, I was going to come back you know and talk a little bit about the investigation that yeah. 
that eventually resolved this, uh, that eventually you know solved this this crime. But um, Carolyn, should we pivot a little bit to the dangers? The dangers. Them? Yep. <laughs> The dangers of being a diplomat. One of the dangers. Now, he, and, and, and he was an ex-diplomat, obviously, but yeah. uh, he had been, you know, he had been a former foreign minister, he had a former ambassador, and he was functioning effectively as a diplomat. Now, you know, diplomacy, um, you know, diplomats throughout history have been, been protected individuals. And, you know, law and custom everywhere in the world has dictated that, you know, diplomats particularly ambassadors, are treated as the personal representatives of sovereigns. And to kill the personal representative of sovereign historically been considered an exceptional crime. That's like a line you don't cross. It's a taboo, you know, it is a cultural, and in some societies even a religious taboo. And when these taboos were broken, consequences were often dire historically. I mean, Herodotus talks about what the Persian invasion of Greece in 490. Uh, that you know occurred when Sparta and Athens executed the envoys that had been sent to them by Darius the Great. Wow! So that sparked a war. Yeah, Greece won the war, but still, it was it was it was a uh, it was a cause of war. Here, uh, another example. I some might recognize um, the defenestration of Prague. Thirty Years' War. This is the moment the Thirty Years' War started in, in, in Europe when two envoys from King Ferdinand II were thrown from third floor windows in Prague by uh, uh, these Bohemian Protestants who didn't like the message they were hearing. Wow. Thirty Years' War started uh, thereafter. These are sort of two of the famous examples that are often cited uh, about um, uh, you know about about diplomats as 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 um, as protected persons. Mm -hmm. Now, in modern times, the, the the protections that diplomats receive have been codified in the Vene the the Vienna Convention, uh, the Vienna Treaty, the Vienna Convention of 1961, UN Treaties of 1973. These conventions and treaties, interestingly, are subscribed to by almost every nation. They're kind of unusual in that um, you know they've achieved a degree of international unanimity. These treaties that that most treaties do not. So. Diplomats what I find fascinating yeah. that those treaties in my life, you know, we think about, so that's 1618 in Prague. Mm -hmm. So it's not until well into the 20th century that there are treaties that countries agree to, to protect diplomats. Right. Is well, that because up till that time, it didn't seem a necessity to do that? It was up to that time, customs and traditions were strong enough that uh, the issue rarely arose. Threats to diplomats uh, from state actors uh, almost never arose. Uh, now, these new conventions and treaties from the 60s and 70s also spelled out in great detail what each state's responsibilities were for protecting diplomats. And so it, it, it kind of creates international rules of the road. Mm -hmm. it's, it spelled out what before had been really a matter of custom and tradition. Um, let me, um, I can find, whoops, let me go back here a second. The, the, um, this, you know, the, 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 the point that, that um, I guess I really want to make is that despite all of these formal protections, diplomacy has become an ever more dangerous profession in recent years. Right. And, that's, the, that's been the case during, during my lifetime, uh, during the, the time that I spent in the Foreign Service. And, and, and the reason for this, I think, very, very clearly, very obviously, has been the rise of, of non-state actors mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. who have discovered that diplomats are high-value targets. Uh, and these non-state actors, they may be rebels, they may be insurgents, they may be revolutionaries, they may be extremists, they may be terrorists, but you know, they, 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 they have come to realize that diplomats make excellent hostages and they make excellent, excellent symbols. They are excellent symbols if you're a group that is trying to, trying to achieve some sort of uh, notoriety. And they're not particularly bound to any kind of treaty playbook. Not at all. Yeah. 
I mean, governments, governments uh, avoid killing envoys. <laughs> Non-state actors uh, go out of their way to do so and also to be sure to leave their fingerprints all over the scene of the crime. And that's the next, the slide in Nairobi. Yeah. That you well, showed that image. Uh, that's a, um... This, this is, this is, these are the non-state actors here uh, are, uh, are Al-Qaeda, the East Africa cell of Al-Qaeda, uh, detonating a uh, bomb at Embassy Nairobi, August 7, 1998. That's our embassy. That's the back of our embassy. All of those windows blown out. Um, and I'll, I have some other slides here. I'll show you the extent of the damage to neighboring buildings. Uh, but this particular terrorist attack aimed at the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi killed over 200 and injured over 5,000 people. So, so obviously Americans, but then probably citizens of Nairobi as well. Mostly Kenyans. Mostly Kenyans. But overwhelmingly, the, the, the casualties of this particular terrorist attack were Kenyan citizens, some of them just sitting in their cars, either waiting at bus stops, uh, many of them in, in adjacent buildings, uh, where uh, one of which one of which collapsed. Is this prior to your time in Kenya? It was five days. I arrived in Kenya on August seventh, two thousand and three. Five years to the day after this bombing. Wow. And the first place I went when I arrived was here. This building no longer exists, but what is here is a memorial park that commemorates. That tragic, that tragic event. Um, I wanted to show this slide, if I could, Carolyn. Um, this is a memorial plaque in the Department of State in the lobby of the Department of State, which was established there in the 1930s. And it's for uh, State Department personnel, diplomats, consuls who lost their lives heroically or tragically. And before 1950, almost every one was annotated with something like, as you see here, lost at sea or yellow fever or some other disease or accident. Yeah, exhaustion. When, when exhaustion. Benjamin Ridgely of exhaustion in Mexico City. Yeah, I guess, I guess, uh, I guess he was working pretty hard. You know? <laughs> right. Um, but after 1950, this, this, this uh, plaque starts to expand very rapidly. The numbers tripled since 1950 and almost every single one is the victim of some violent act, bombings, assassinations, uh, kidnapping, and so forth. Uh, so, you know, we've gone from lost at sea and yellow fever to, um, to uh, generally to acts of terrorism. Yeah. And one, one question that I'm sometimes asked is, well, well, how dangerous is it to be an ambassador, let's say, compared to being uh, a military general? And the answer is, um, well, it is more dangerous. Um, since 1960, we've had three uh, U.S. generals killed in the line of duty, one of whom killed in his office at the Pentagon on 9-11. Uh, but at the same time frame, six American ambassadors killed, and all of them died violent deaths, most recently Chris Stevens. And, uh, and uh, so uh, we have far fewer ambassadors than generals. Um, and um, Is that so? Really? There are fewer U.S. ambassadors than there are U.S. generals? At any one time, we have no more than 200 ambassadors in various places around the world, and we certainly have more than 200 generals at any one time. Right, that's right. So, um, I wanted to mention a little bit about diplomatic security. These are the people that are supposed to keep diplomats safe. Now, uh, here is one agent. I don't know. I think this is a place in Africa where he's protecting a U.N. compound. Um, it's another photograph of uh, the Secretary of State at the time. These are diplomatic security officers. These are foreign service officers, but they're specialized in diplomacy, uh, I'm sorry, in security. Um, diplomatic security uh, is the fastest growing part of the State Department, the fastest growing office in the State Department with the fastest growing budget. There are now today something like 2,400 of these special agents around the world whose job is essentially to protect American diplomatic facilities and uh, American diplomatic personnel. Is this agency or is this part of the State Department yes. um, headquartered here in DC? Yes. In Maine State? Mm -hmm. They, you know, those guards that you see in front of the State Department, they are part of diplomatic security. Uh, diplomatic security here, these guys are protecting, this is probably someplace in Africa, 
Uh, they also have the job of protecting foreign heads of state and, and VIPs who visit the United States. Uh, I was looking at a photograph the other day of, of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle being protected by diplomatic security agents. Mm. So this is, unfortunately, this is the fastest growing office and area of activity in the State Department, reflecting the, the fact that diplomacy has become uh, an, an increasingly dangerous profession. Right. Um, this, um, I this, thought I'd a little this bit. building will be familiar to some people participating. I, know that I recognize this building. I was going to talk a little bit to illustrate the point I make about, about the increasing dangers of diplomacy. I was going to talk a little bit about my own experiences. Um, this is the Iranian embassy uh, on Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, and it looked exactly uh, this way. This is a recent photograph. Uh, when I walked through that door in 1974, this was the first embassy of any kind that I ever set foot in. I was a graduate student, and we were guests of the Iranian ambassador, the personal representative of the Shah. Uh, and as I recall, there was no metal detector. There was no security. You know, we were simply ushered in through this door and, uh, and, and, and treated as, as guests, 1974. And I bet it's beautiful inside. It was a beautiful embassy inside, uh, or at least it was in 1974. Uh, but that is, that's, the, that's, the, that's exactly the same building uh, as was there in 1974. Three years later, um, I saw my first metal detector being installed in the U.S. consulate in Naples. And uh, I remember thinking that, you know, wow, what have we come to? You know, that we have to uh, pass people through metal detectors. Uh, at that time, the public would simply come through the front door and come to my office on the first floor there seeking visas. And sometimes that was the main function? Them, interview them at my desk in my right. office. Today, but let's say if I had been a tourist mm -hmm. in Naples and I'm walking by there and I say, oh, look, there's, hey, there's the consulate. I could have just walked in to say, hello, I'm visiting from Washington, D.C. Oh, how are you, Mr. Bellamy? Mm -hmm. It was that kind of the vibe then? There would have been somebody in the lobby. You could have walked in and said, I'm here to see so and so. And they would have said, third floor. <laughs> you walk in. Today, you, you, you know, those same visas are only issued by appointment. Uh, the interviews take place through thick bulletproof glass and in heavily guarded surroundings. So, But this still is our building. In it is. And if I were a diplomatic security analyst, I would say not good, not safe, because it doesn't have any setback. See that? I mean, mm -hmm. there's, it's right on the road. So it is extremely vulnerable to the kind of uh, truck bomb that brought down our embassy in Nairobi. But you can see from, if you're thinking about being inviting mm -hmm. and wanting to have a, a wonderful site to disseminate American culture, what a great building, right? Yeah. What a great setting. Oh, it was great. I mean, that, you know, uh, the Consul General used to entertain visitors on that roof. I there. wondered about that, yeah. 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 Uh, well, this is this is also a theme. As it has become increasingly dangerous, it is uh, it, it is meant that American diplomats, and I'm going to talk about this in a moment, have had to retreat into uh, increasingly fortified positions, and this has had the effect of cutting them off, in many cases, from the populations that you know they are meant to mix with and to and to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, I talked a little bit before. You know, this is this was my first. Uh, uh, posting in the in the in the Foreign Service. Um, here we are back at Embassy. This is another picture of the Embassy in Nairobi. Wow. Uh, when I arrived uh, there in 2003, I knew that I was on the uh, the, the list, the hit list for Al Qaeda, uh, the Al Qaeda East Africa cell. You knew that before you embarked. Yes, I, yes, I did. I did, and I knew that, that when well, you. Well, well, hold on now, because I'm a I'm a citizen here and. The first thing that comes to my mind, I'll tell you, when I think about someone who Al Qaeda, the Taliban would want to get, I think about Daniel Pearl. Mm -hmm. I think about Daniel Pearl being beheaded, mm -hmm. about it being videotaped and broadcast. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't know about that probably yet, but mm -hmm. how did that make you feel? Well, it, you know, I, 
I, I, I knew that I would be considered, just because of my position, I would be considered a high value target for Al Qaeda. Uh, I also knew that I was going to get pretty good protection. And indeed, I, I couldn't go anywhere without being in an armored vehicle and surrounded by bodyguards. Um, I where would, did you, where did you, is that, was it a compound you lived on or was your residence separate I, from where you went to work? I had a residence apart from the embassy uh, that, that had, that, that was guarded 24 seven. You know, I had armed guards uh, and it, it felt a little bit like confinement. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I did not drive my own vehicle. I never went out of my compound without, uh, without a, a security, without a security detail. That was just, that was just the, the, the rule. But I, I was less worried actually about myself than I was about our staff, you know, our, our embassy members and personnel who, uh, who didn't have the same level of protection. Um, oh, okay. I spent uh, my entire time as ambassador, the three years I spent as ambassador in Kenya, focused on security issues, uh, focused on trying to prevent, you know, this scene from mm -hmm. recurring. Mm -hmm. uh, in keeping people safe. Not the not what I wanted to do as ambassador during my three years in Africa, but um, I, you know, running down this Al Qaeda cell and keeping our people safe, pretty much took up all of my time. Wow. So, and so that that's one, I think, one illustration of how how things change over time. Um, and um, um, as I say, I, I would have preferred doing other things, but you know, my job was was to was to ensure that we were secure. Uh, I just I'll show another. Yeah, show another one. Yeah. Photograph here. This is this is Benghazi, 2012. Um, um, I, I was especially saddened by Chris Stevens' uh, death, and and saddened too by the way some opportunists here in Congress tried to capitalize on this for for political gain. You know, uh, you know, very few who commented on Benghazi in the aftermath, particularly in Congress, actually went to the trouble to analyze uh, or think about the risks that he faced uh, and the risk that other ambassadors run on a, on a daily basis. And very little in the aftermath about making sure that he and other diplomats had the resources they need to be, to be safe. Uh, and it, I just remember in reading about him and his um, commitment to diplomacy that the scenario that you described in Nairobi of being kind of confined and having to focus so much on security, um, it seems like that was enormously frustrating to him. Yes. I remember reading about him wanting to leave mm -hmm. this compound and go out into where the people lived. And I'm sure he was thinking, I just want to show a positive American presence. That's right. And that's a decision. Yeah, that's a very tough decision. I think that that uh, that 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 we have to make is that uh, to what extent um, are are we willing to run certain risks in order to do our jobs effectively? No one wants to be barricaded in their embassy. No one wants to only receive visitors in their office. You have to be out. You have to be seen. You have to be visible, and um, uh, that's what you do. And sometimes, uh, no matter how good you are, and Chris Stevens was a very good ambassador, sometimes no matter how good you are, you make a mistake. I've been asked about this a lot, and I said, you know, it doesn't matter how good a Formula One driver you are, if you make one mistake, you know, it, it can be fatal. Yeah. It's kind of, I kind of liken the situation in Benghazi on that day in 2012 to one mistake, mm -hmm. a fatal mistake. Mm -hmm. Um, well, we've talked a lot about the dangers and the violence and so forth. Let me come back to Embassy Row. This looks pretty peaceful, right? By comparison. Uh, That's the and I mean, we, I, we can attest to that. Anyone, any Washing Walks guide who does this walking tour, and we've been doing it now for two decades, peaceful, welcoming, uh, very visually appealing, interesting, Yes. I would say it would be how you would define this. I mean, most people's experience in DC, this is probably a drive-by, zooming down Massachusetts Avenue, you know, maybe out from by the cathedral. Um, but for a walk, traffic noise is kind of loud, but it's, yeah, it's peaceful. Yeah. 
I mean, if you, this is right below Sheridan Circle. This is a stretch of, of embassies. And, you know, you contrast this. There are some foreign embassies in Washington that are sort of barricaded behind high walls or behind fences, but most are not. Uh, and many, like these, uh, can be accessed just by climbing a few stairs and ringing a doorbell. A couple of other examples. This is the Indian Embassy. Yeah. The Phillips Gallery there on um, Q Street. Yep. Um, pedestrian traffic right in front of the embassy, ring the doorbell, someone will. Right. Wait. And actually, and what also gives this, this embassy a presence and a very appealing presence is that we can't see it, but right across from that building is a nice little pocket park yes. with a memorial to Mahatma Gandhi. Absolutely. You could Absolutely. sit there and, you know, watch traffic go by, look at this building, look across the street at the Anderson House, Society of the Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. and oftentimes the Indian Embassy will stage little events there next to the Gandhi statue on the on the park and you know it's a it's a way of interacting with the public and 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 being relatively safe at the same time a uh, similar story this is the South African Embassy this is a few years old I mean there is a, a wrought iron fence now running along the sidewalk there but this was the South African Embassy for a long time including during the the years of the anti-apartheid protests that brought protesters and to chain themselves up against that, uh, that, that fence and so forth. Very, very accessible, very typical, very typical of an embassy row uh, yeah. embassy in, in Washington. And, and if folks don't realize where that is, that's, that's almost directly across the street from the British embassy. Right. And there's a wonderful interplay. We can just maybe make out by the flagpole, there's a statue, a life-size statue of Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. who is uh, across the street from a life-size statue of Winston Churchill. That's right. And you know, while I'm thinking of it, as a really powerful example of how welcoming and open the embassy community here is in Washington, D.C., is that um, we're not going to be able to have it next month, but in May, there's always the um, European Union Embassy Open House, and then there's the round the world embassy tour where countless foreign governments open up their buildings to the public and people stand in long lines to go inside and look and get a little glimpse of the culture of that country. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, when you think about how open that is, it's amazing. Yeah, I don't think you have to go through a metal detector for that. I, when, I haven't been the fa past few years, but not when I went before. Even, even last time I went, I got to go into the Afghan embassy in Calarama. Mm -hmm. No metal detectors. No metal detectors. Mm -mm. No Taliban on Massachusetts Avenue, I guess. <laughs> I guess not. We hope not. Uh, it, just, to, just to provide the viewers with a little bit of contrast, this, this sort of scene of tranquility on, on Embassy Row in the U.S., and uh, to look at what some of our embassies look like now overseas, this is the uh, U.S. Embassy in London on, on um, Grosvenor Square uh, a few years ago. Um, and uh, traffic used to circulate in front of it. Uh, now they'd put up some bollards and, and made it more restrictive. But still, this was judged to be far too exposed, far too exposed to truck bombs or car bombs. A new embassy was needed to provide more setback. And so... There's the new embassy, right? Uh, complete with a moat. Um, that, if you want setback, that's setback. You know, um, that's an embassy that's hard to get into, mm -hmm. either by vehicle or on foot, which is the way it's designed. But it, it typifies what we were saying earlier. It also emphasizes the fact that the U.S. embassy is cut off from the community in which it's um, uh, in which it's supposed to operate. Right. I mean, it's interesting visually, I'm sure they were trying to achieve a balance between a very, what I suppose they hope will become an iconic building. It's mm -hmm. the setback gives it a presence. You can see it from all four sides. It's architecturally distinct. Mm -hmm. So you'll go, oh yeah, that's the embassy building. Mm -hmm. Not quite as well known as the Gherkin, but that's the American embassy building. <laughs> but then that setback also delivers um, quite a stark message. Wow. considering the traditional relationship those our two countries have had yes which is the open arms they mm -hmm. may probably don't want us to hug them but you know friendly <laughs> it is it is it's a it's it, it it's um 
it's an appealing building, a building in many ways. It's also, you know, a symbol of a, of a pretty big American investment in the yeah. U.S. Uh, but it also, it also radiates a, a certain distance and certain, you know, apprehension, if you will, you know, a worry. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I, I selected another example here. Um, this is the former U.S. Consulate General in Istanbul, uh, a stately building uh, mm -hmm. in uh, downtown Istanbul. It's sort of an embassy row that Beaux Arts, early wow. late twentieth, early nineteenth, or late nineteenth, early twentieth century, Beaux Arts aesthetic of our embassy row. Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I suspect this was uh, this was uh, once the U.S. consulate in Constantinople, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and um, and it, it, for many years there. But 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 by uh, by modern times, it has become completely insecure, for obvious reasons, and so you end up with is this. Uh, this is the U.S. consulate in Istanbul now. It's a fortress on a hillside. I'll tell you. And it's out of town. Uh, oh, yeah. You can sort of get a feel for that from the background. Yeah, this is not downtown any longer. So uh, this, this really symbolizes the isolation of American diplomats uh, today because of security reasons. Maybe very nice inside. It undoubtedly is a very safe setting. Uh, but, you know, it's not one that many of your Turkish guests would feel comfortable visiting uh, uh, or anybody else would feel comfortable visiting for that matter. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's, not, it's not, particularly, not particularly welcoming. No. This is the norm. This is the norm around the world now for U.S. Embassy, uh, US embassy structures. So what do you think, Carolyn? Should we talk about... Um, Oh, maybe we should talk about this. Yes, this is this will be in many people's minds, and I think actually someone mentioned this in our um, chat function. Yeah. Here it happens again. We're back on Sheridan Circle, mm -hmm. and nothing's exploding. A no. car bomb's not going off, but something appalling and actually deeply disturbing is happening here. That's right. Um, you know, we talked about it being a, 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 you know, Embassy Row being a pretty, pretty, pretty quiet place for the most part. There are obviously demonstrations from time to time. Sometimes they're vocal, sometimes they're noisy, but very rarely do you have violence on Massachusetts Avenue, Embassy Row. This, um, this incident occurred um, just a few hours after Turkish President Erdogan had, had met with President Trump at the White House. He was returning to the Turkish ambassador's residence on Sheridan Circle. Uh, when he noticed that there was a large crowd of demonstrators in the circle across the street uh, protesting Turkish treatment of the Kurds. Um, his bodyguards, together with a number of other Turkish counter demonstrators, uh, charged into this crowd of mostly American citizens, uh, badly beating uh, a number of them, uh, assaulting some uh, police officers as well, and sending 11, 11 people to hospital. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's remarkable to me, not only for the brazenness of this, which, which took place in full view of, of President Erdogan, who uh, was watching this unfold, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, it's remarkable in that these, are, uh, these bodyguards uh, are protected by diplomatic immunity. Um, and this may be the first case of persons protected by diplomatic immunity assaulting American citizens in front of their, in front of their country's embassy. Um, in any event, this, this particular outrage uh, occurred in almost exactly the same spot as the car bombing, right, right, right here, right across the street, right. uh, as the car bombing uh, uh, in, uh, in 1976, the, the, the Tivoli bombing. So, so uh, what finally um, happens, this is a, a Chilean former diplomat, an American citizen, and her husband, um, she's killed, he's killed. Mm -hmm. who, who was called to account for this? How, how is justice achieved for either yeah. of those people? I, 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 can, I can provide more detail, but I'll, I'll give you the short version. Justice was achieved mainly because there were some hardworking, very determined, mid-level U.S. government officials. At the State US, Department? Yes, two U.S. Uh, Justice Department assistant attorneys, U.S. Assist assistant attorneys. Uh, a small team of FBI investigators, and one 
mid-level foreign service officer at the State Department, who decided that despite a distinct lack of enthusiasm on the part of their departments for investigating this, uh, got together and started sharing information and combing files and trading leads. And it was really through the work of these mid-level officials that, the, uh, that they were able to break this, this case open. Uh, interestingly, uh, they got a very valuable lead from a Cuban diplomat who shared information with an FBI source who pointed to the Cuban exile community in the United States, and then who had some information on an American citizen uh, who uh, was in fact working for Chilean intelligence. And um, by following those leads, uh, they were able to determine, uh, they were eventually able to track this crime to the very top levels of Chilean intelligence, a man named Juan Manuel Contreras. Uh, and then from there, were able to determine that he had received his orders from President Pinochet. The top. Yeah. By 19, actually it was really fairly quickly, by 1977, 78, uh, U.S. intelligence services, the CIA, had figured out that, that Pinochet had actually uh, ordered or the crime. But he, in his lifetime, was never, um, there wasn't a trial, there wasn't any kind of um, conviction. No. The, 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 the actual, um, there, there was interesting, the, the indictments were handed down in the United States on 1st of August, 1978. And they indicted eight people, uh, four Cubans, three Chileans, and this, this one American. Um, uh, the, 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 um, Chile initially would not extradite the, the, the Chileans that had been indicted in the United States. But, but some years later, they were actually brought to trial in Chile using the evidence that American investigators had put, been able to put together. And the perpetrators of this particular crime were put away for life in Chile. Wow. And they were, they, were convinced, they were convicted of a number of other atrocities as well, but they essentially died in prison. Wow. Um, Pinochet, you know, had his own issues uh, later on. He was sought by Spain and a number of other countries that were right. him. And he ends up, he spends the last years of his life living in, in Britain? No, he, he lives, spends the last year of his life living in, in Chile. Okay. Uh, but he's continuing to fight off, you know, court case after court case after court case. Why do I, why do I, did he go get medical treatment in Britain? I just remember there was a time when people were very angry with Margaret Thatcher for yeah. seeing you, um, Mark, Margaret Thatcher um, um, sent him a bottle of scotch saying, you know, you know, Britain will never let you down. <laughs> he went to uh, Britain for um, back surgery. And as soon as he got to Britain, the Spanish, uh, Spanish courts issued a, a, a warrant for his arrest. Uh, and uh, he ended up being stuck for two years in Britain. Well, uh, okay, house, that's what I'm remembering. Okay. The House of Lords were debating, debating this, and there was a huge, there was kind of a huge international uproar, not only because it was Pinochet, but because the Spanish were, were exercising universal jurisdiction, which was kind of a controversial concept at the time. Uh, but from that point on, Pinochet was sick, uh, and uh, he, was, he was pretty much fighting off legal challenges for the rest of his life. Well, uh, the uh, Chilean government ends up for a while, there's the memorial to Latelier and Ronnie Moffat. Mm -hmm. Who put that there? Do you know? I do not know. Let me just go. either. There's, there's the American uh, co-conspirator, now in witness protection someplace in the United States. This is the yes. memo from George Shultz to Ronald Reagan saying, we know that Pinochet ordered the killing. There's the bust of Orlando Latelier in front of the Chilean embassy. Right, so times have changed mm -hmm. in a way. Um, under Pinochet, that would never have happened, but it's different. There's a different government now and different feelings about Latelier's legacy and importance to them. Very much so, very much so. Really, it was beginning in the 1990s that Chilean courts started digging into the atrocities of the Pinochet years and bringing indictments against different, different figures uh, and, and that's really when the tide began to turn in Chile. And this memorial to him, or this bus, this is just maybe two years old. This is new, you're right. And I've, I've actually never actually seen it. 
um, but it is recent. And what's really touching, I remember the Post did a very good job of covering the um, dedication of it, and his three sons were there. Yes. And some of their children were there, and I cannot remember if Ronnie Moffat's husband was there or not. Uh, but his, one of his sons pointed out that they they were older, standing on the steps of that embassy, they were older now than their father ever got to live to be. That's right. I think maybe, uh, Caroline, I'm not sure, it might have been on the 40th anniversary of the, uh, of the bombing. Uh, well, we have really helpful information yeah. from Andrea um, Singer, who said it was the Institute for Policy Studies who erected the memorial. Okay. For Ronnie Moffat and Orlando Letelier. Uh, now there, there was a, there's the other plaque, uh, Carolyn, that, uh, there's Ronnie Moffat. That's the only photograph of, of Ronnie Moffat that I could find. Um, the plaque uh, on um, Sheridan Circle, mm -hmm. which is at the exact site of the bombing, uh, with flowers and the with the image of of Letelier and Ronnie Moffat together, and and maybe was it uh, the IPS that actually put this plaque in place, or was it that that I don't know. I should. That's know. what I think. That's what Andrea, who's participating, that's what she shared. Yeah. Yeah. So there it is today. No. You know, I, I I will say that I I don't know that this crime would have been solved, or would have been solved for a long time had it not been really for the determination of those, uh, those civil servants, really, uh, who, um, who were determined to go ahead, even though they were not getting much encouragement or help from, from, from higher levels within their, within their departments. And uh, so, so they deserve uh, a lot of credit for this. Yes, and, uh, I'm sure they were um, in many moments going against a tide or maybe not getting the cooperation that they would have hope they were going to receive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I oh, think Andrea Seeger, she's, I'm so glad she's participating. She's also sharing that every year on the Sunday closest to the anniversary of the bombing at 10 a.m. there's a memorial ceremony hosted by Institute for Policy Studies. That's, That's good to know. To know. That is good I wonder to know. if this is the aftermath, like this, this is these flowers are all there after that um, ceremony has occurred. Could well be. It could well be uh, there. You know, there might there might be other uh, ceremonies commemorating it as well. But um, um, I think it's uh, it's good. You know, I I, I, um, I you know I don't like to think that the successful conclusion of this investigation made uh, Embassy Row any safer. You know, but I, I think it is good that you know the the one act of state-sponsored terrorism that occurred here was tracked down, was resolved. The, assass the assassins were exposed and they were punished. So this, you know, while a lot of things uh, end in impunity, uh, this one did not. And you know that's a maybe small consolation, but it's uh, it's it's still a good ending to the story. It is. Thank you. You know, here's an interesting, Stu Simon is sharing that the Peace Corps long resisted State Department security office demands that they turn their offices into fortresses because of their particular focus on staying accessible and hospitable in their host countries. Yes, uh, absolutely. And, you know, one of the, the, the Peace Corps cannot operate in the conditions that I've just described where that other diplomats are operating in. By the nature of it, the Peace Corps is out uh, among the population, living amongst the population, mingling with the population. And so when the Peace Corps has to withdraw, it's a, um, you know, it's, it's, well, it's impossible. It's impossible to operate from behind a, from, from behind a barricade. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, uh, I think the, the overall security situation in, in many countries has resulted in, in simply having to move, pull the Peace Corps out in many places where in past years they might have been able to, might have been able to operate. Right. 
one of my constant work, I mean, I, you know, I did pay a lot of attention. We had 144 Peace Corps volunteers in Kenya when I was ambassador. Um, and uh, I worried a lot about them. You know, we kept, we kept track of them. And, and, and fortunately, because they were dispersed, many of them living in villages, we reckoned that they were probably not going to be high value targets for the kind of people that we were facing, the Al-Qaeda cells. Uh, but still, we worried a great deal about their safety. When you started your career, I mean, let's go back, maybe let's go to Naples when you're there. So you say metal detectors, and you think, ah, oh, what have we come to? What was your biggest concern as a member of the Foreign Service when you were there? And how did that, how did that change to when you got to Kenya? You mean the biggest safety concern? Yeah, or safety, yeah. Wow. Um, probably getting pickpocketed. Um, um, or being being a victim of of, of um, small scale street crime, actually, which not, not not much. There was a terrorist threat in Italy at the time, um, and it was. But however, it was mostly directed. It was a it, it was from the Red Brigades. The so called people will remember perhaps the Red Brigades who were um, attacking. Um, uh, taking hostages and killing prominent Italian businessmen, lawyers, politicians, and so forth, and who had a very much an anti-Western, anti-NATO agenda. Uh, but even so, we did not feel particularly threatened by that terrorist organization at the mm -hmm. time. How did you go from your office in the building that you showed us the image of to where your residence was? I walked out the door of my apartment uh, a few blocks to a, um, a cable car a funicular railway, uh, a little cable car that went up and down the side of the mountain. And uh, I would, I had a little paper ticket and I would sit in the cabin and go down through three or four stops on the way down the mountain and then walk along the, the waterfront to my office. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a car. Is that sort of <laughs> ideal? <laughs> anyway, but so I just, I just, you know, I just walked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I never, and I never felt that there was a security threat. Right. Right. Um, let me see. Someone is asking, or just yeah, asking, um, what are embassies that are 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 you involved today with with uh, the? I'm sure the Foreign Service, American Foreign Service, but do you have any involvement anymore with um, the foreign embassy presence here in Washington? Sure. I mean, I I, I do I do interact. Uh... In my, in my other lines of work, I do interact with foreign diplomats and foreign governments here in Washington. Yes, fair amount. And for us um, lay people, there are many countries that would welcome us and, and really are enthusiastic about us learning about their culture, learning about their countries, their geography. And some even will have as part of their presence here, a cultural center. And well, I'm thinking of along Embassy Row, the Korean, cultural mm -hmm. center mm -hmm. that South Korea has in downtown right near 16th and L. Uh, the country of Oman has a really impressive mm -hmm. cultural center open to the public mm -hmm. that we can access. But they also have, um, many of them also do have cultural events, concerts, lectures mm -hmm. that the public is allowed to participate in. And the series, they often do that through, I think it's, is it the embassy series? It might mm -hmm. be embassyseries.org. You can find out um, about opportunities to go into these buildings and interact with. Yes, I, it's a very, for, for most governments and for most embassies, uh, a, a big part of what they do is this kind of outreach, this sort of cultural outreach or what is now called public diplomacy. Uh, and, um, so, you know, you will, and for, for many embassies, in fact, that is the public, their, their public face uh, in the, uh, uh, to, to for Americans. Uh, I mean, you know, I spent a lot of my diplomatic career in France and, you know, this is, this is very big for, for France, Fran the, the um, promotion of French culture, French language uh, is, uh, is, is something that uh, the French foreign ministry spends a lot of time on. So uh, the United States uh, does too. We used to do a lot more than, than we do now. And part of the reason we don't do as much now, unfortunately, is for security reasons, access. 
You know, we used to have libraries around the world and in many capitals of the world, the American library was a primary uh, resource for many scholars and students in, in, in different capitals. And a lot of those libraries have unfortunately closed either for budgetary or for security reasons. You know, speaking of France, there may be a lot of folks who live here in the metro area, you may not know, and it would be understandable that you wouldn't know this. The French embassy in Washington is across the street from Georgetown University Hospital. It is set back and it has a compound sort of fortress feel. You don't yeah. think, oh, I could just walk through those gates and go in. Well, in fact, you can, and you probably know this, Mark, that they have a cafe that's open to the public and you can go in and have a little bistro lunch right in that embassy building. Well, I did <laughs> not know like that. You can, they don't like have a sign out on the fence guarding their embassy, but if you go to their website, there you get to see the menu, the menu changes. Um, it's quite good. Why <laughs> I'll drop in. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah you can do that. The, the, the entrance to the French embassy is pretty formidable. It looks like it's meant to deter a, you know, deter a, a, via, you know, a vehicle attack or something. Yes, yeah. And I will say, no, this is not a cafe that's like open for breakfast. It's not like a, um, a bistro in France, but um, it's lunchtime. You can definitely go in for lunch. Good. Oh, and someone is saying, well, you do have to sign up before you go to the cafe. You can't just <laughs> walk in, but at least you can go in. You can get an appointment. You can get a reservation. Okay. Yeah. You get a little card yeah. to go in. Thank you, Mark, so much well, Carolyn, my pleasure. for spending this time with us. Um, let me just say one thing to folks participating. A couple of you have asked, can these webinars be viewed on demand afterward? Yes. Um, this is part of our learning curve at Washington Walks. We're having a little bit of a, a longer time to get them up on our website than we wanted. We think we're going to have that resolved this week with this week's series. So stay tuned. We're going to get them there because we, we very much want them to be available for viewing afterward. This evening, we're going to be talking with Hillrag film critic Mike Canning about 1951 landmark science fiction film, The Day the Earth Stood Still, when a flying saucer sails across the National Mall and lands on the ellipse. What ensues? Next Wednesday, in this same time slot, I'm going to be doing an exploration of um, the role that First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy had in preserving Lafayette Park, the seven acre area right in front of the White House. She kind of has become known as the savior of the square, but the question is, was she the only savior? So we'll talk about that next week. Thank you, Mark, Thank so you. much. It was My pleasure. Hearing your story. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.